Uh, good morning. Uh, this morning, we are going to read uh, words, words, uh, poems, and uh, also the essay entitled Yeshin Ecology. Uh, the three poems you are going to read, uh, She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Ways, is about a little flower uh, called Violet. Violet. And another poem is Wandered, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. And finally, my heart leaps up. Uh, those three poems are very beautiful. And uh, then we are going to uh, read the essay about uh, Yeats's poetry <coughs> and uh, Yeats's idea of uh, nature. Okay. Okay. Why don't we go to the poems? Okay, three sets of uh, handouts. Okay, take one. Okay. And take one. Another set. Take one. Okay, first, uh, the uh, first poem is very short. She dwelt among the untrodden ways. She dwelt among the untrodden ways, beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love. A violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star, only when only, uh, when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in a grave, and oh, the difference to me. Uh, this is a very short poem, and uh, let's go back to the first stanza. She dwelt among the untrodden ways. She dwelt among the untrodden ways. She lived among the untrodden ways. And instead of uh, live, the verb live, the poet used the verb dwell. Dwelt, dwelt, dwell, dwelt, dwell. Why? Why did the poet use the uh, verb dwell instead of lived? For alliteration. Ways, dwelt, 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 dwelt. She, she dwelt among the untrodden ways. Where? Beside the springs of Dove. <coughs> Dove is uh, capitalized, D, <coughs> right? D is capitalized. Dove is what? What is it? Uh, it's the name of a uh, liver. Footnote. Uh, footnote two. There are several ways by this name in England, including one in the Lake District. One of the rivers called Dove flows in the uh, lake, uh, lake District. So beside the springs of Dove, beside the springs of Dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love. The first stanza ends with colon, right? Colon. So who is she here? Who is she? You mean, who is she? Violet, a flower of violet. Right? Violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye. You can find the flower half hidden. The flower is what? The flower is fair, is a, as fair as a star. When only one is shining in the sky. Only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown. And few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in a grave, and oh, the difference to me. You like the poem? Okay, there is another one. Uh, 
the second poem we are reading is, uh, we are going to read is, uh, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And the uh, speaker is, who is the speaker here? Okay, first uh, I'm going to read the whole poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills when all at once, all at once I saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, the fluttering and dancing in the bridge. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretch in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought to what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure feels and dance with the daffodils. Very beautiful form, right? So, in stanza one, I wander lonely as a cloud. I, the speaker is I. Who is he? Who is I here? Hmm? Who? Who is the speaker? The, uh, the, the speaker I is who? Of course, the cloud. Also, I is uh, I in here. The speaker I is what? The poet. So, I wandered lonely as a cloud that flows, uh, a cloud that flows on, flows on high over hills and vales and hills, vales, vales and hills, vales, vales and hills, valleys, <coughs> small valleys, and hills, mountains, okay? over vales and hills, when all at once, I saw a crowd, and all at once, I saw a crowd. A crowd of what? <coughs> daffodils, flowers, right? A crowd or host of golden daffodils. Where? Where are the flowers? Beside the lake. Beside the lake, beneath the trees. And uh, they are doing what? They are fluttering and dancing in the bridge. Continuous as the star, they shine, twinkle on the Milky Way. Hey. So, is a, is a comparison, right? Uh, are they stars? No, they are not stars, but uh, continuous as the star, they shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. Is a comparison. They, are, they, they, they sound, look like uh, stars, right? Uh, st stars, they shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretch. They stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand I saw at a glance. Ten thousand. I saw ten thousand at a glance, tossing their heads in a sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced. It's interesting, right? Uh, they com uh, the the uh, daffodils are compared with the stars, and then uh, they are compared with the waves, sparkling waves, right? So, uh, but, but they out outdid the sparkling waves in glee. Outdid means what? They, they, uh, out means, the prefix out means what? Do better than something, right? So, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee a boy could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the, sh uh, the, the show to me ha had brought. The show had brought to me what wealth, uh, little thought. For oft, often, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bleats of solitude. So uh, this is uh, this image similar to the poet Yeats when he was in London alone, walking on the street. Uh, he looks back on 
uh, his uh, mother's hometown, Sligo, where he spent his childhood, right? Sligo, right? Sligo. Le lake, the Lake Isle of Innisfree. You remember? Right. So, uh, and then my heart fills with the pleasure and dances with the daffodil. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, and the finally, the third point. My heart leaps up. My heart leaps up when I behold the rainbow in the sky. So was it when my, when my life began. So is it now I'm a man. So be it when I shall grow old. Let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Okay, you like them? You like these at uh, these points? Okay, uh, I'll go to the essay. Uh, all of you summarize this poem, right? Ecology. Uh, this paper redefines some of Yeats's poems that have key, some key imagery anchored in nature. We live in a different world compared with 19th and 20th century. Poets respond to the world differently. Poets write poetry in a different way. That is to say, English poetry has, since the 16th century, uh, uh, has, since uh, the 16th century, had different poets who developed new language, Spencer, Shakespeare, Don, pop, romantics, uh, modern poets, and postmodern poets, or historically, neoclassicism, romanticism, modernism. The 21st century movement of new poetry has to wait until historians create new term, ecologism, as from a term, ecologist. Ecopoeticism, or simply ecopoetry movement, Last year, I attended an international conference on poetry and politics held in Wuhan, China, for two days from September 29, 30, uh, 2011, hosted by the Chinese and American Association for Poetry and Politics. There were two sessions entitled Eco Poetry and Eco Politics, which attracted my attention. The title of the papers for the session were The Evolution of a Canon, Eco Poetry and its Theoretical Implications. Uh, pastoral poetry or eco poetry, Wu Chang's poetry, Peter Wang, William Carlos Williams' environmental response to modern paint painters. Uh, another, another essay on Mark uh, Tredenick's Poetics of Place, uh, uh, Geopiety, a the theme of post humanism in Gary Schneider's work. And another paper. Ecology of Consciousness in Alice Sitwell's Three Atomic Age Poems, and another one, an ecological theme of humanity in Shakespeare sonnets. And Coolidge uh, from an ecocritical perspective. And uh, geographical images and their implication, Emily Dickens Portly, Escape and Watch, Interpreting Emily Dickens Portly, Race, Gender, Nature, Ecofeminism Analysis Walker's Poetry, a thematic study of the forest by Suzanne Stewart, etc. Uh, eco poetry is not no poetry. As we see the poets treated in the sessions, whose poems are thought of as eco poems. I also agree with most of the scholars who chose to discuss both traditional and new poets that uh, they are eco poets who are concerned with nature, but then, why do we need a new term, eco poems? We have now arrived at the point of time in the history of humanity when we are forced, whether we like it or not, to reconsider where we are, what to do with the environment. It seems to me that Mother Nature is no longer in the minds of humans, whose life is solely dependent on it. Nature has, it seems, reached the point where it could no longer sustain humanity and its civilization. Poetry must intervene and reawaken in man the importance of nature again. It ought to be conscious of environment. Don't you think so? Right? Earth cannot sustain any longer, sustain uh, the life of humanity any longer. We are destroying it very fast, right? Uh, so, the poets, the, poet, the poet, this essay discuss are varied. Their poems are very old and new, and from both the East and the West. The oldest, Wu Cheng, 
uh, of the Yuan Dynasty of China, the youngest Susan Stewart of the US. The points discussed are Wu Chang, Shakespeare, College, Emily Dickinson, Edith Sitzwell, William Collins Williams, Gary Schneider, Mark, Mark Trudinick, uh, Alice Walker, Susan Stewart. Besides, two poets are mentioned in the Wikipedia entry, Eco Poetry, John Burnside and Mario Petrucci, which is an anthology of Eco Poetry, Eco Poetry, a critical introduction. There is a journal, Eco Poetics, that specializes in Eco Poetry and Eco Poetics. Two manifestos of Eco Poetry appear in Wikipedia also. Despite all this, there seems to be no consensus as to what eco poetry is and what is poetics is. It seems, it seems to me, however, that uh, many poems by eco poets sound like a political slogans. Politics and poetry do not mix well, as we do, do know well. I think eco critics should not do what Marxist and feminist criticism have done. We should wait and work hard to see good poets who are ec uh, ecology conscious, uh, write wonderful poems as romantic poets and modest poets have done. It is important and necessary to go back to the old poetry and reread it from new ecology conscious perspectives. And simultaneously, it is now vitally important to create new didactic or pure non didactic poetry for nature and the earth and earthlings. Uh, this is why I attempt to reread some of Yeish's poems from the perspective of eco-poetics. Yeish had begun as nature poet and kept writing poems about nature throughout his life, but as he grew old, his attention shifted from nature to the nature of humans. Some of the poems are of great interest to the readers. They are neither ecologues nor pastorals, but the core imagery in the poems is anchored in nature. Richard Elman, read them as symbolic poem, as the elements of nature symbolize the inner feelings of the poet. He distinguishes Yeats and Wordsworth. The latter renews man's bond with nature, while the former represents what's inside man by way of the natural. Wordsworth's theme had been the renewal of man's bond to nature. Yeats's theme was the uncovering of a secret nature in which all outward things took their character from internal pressures. The mighty presence, which for Wordsworth was outside man, was for Yeats inside, and all the scenic elements, such as star, sea, wind, ooze, became emblematic of forces operative within the mind as upon things. Nature poetry plays a dual role. It depicts nature and humans at the same time. The stars are the stars, and the sea is the sea, winds are the winds, on the one hand. On the other, the scenic elements represent poet in a certain place and at a certain time. Something vital is operative and so it's complex a way. Only the poet can express it. Uh, echo poetics in ecological literacy. Critics use the prefix echo to coin new words such as eco poetry, eco poet, eco poetics. However, poets are not eco activists. Poets are well aware that Poets are part of nature and respond to the environment. However, as dwellers of the earth, they seem to sense the danger of, dangers of industrialization and of consumer culture today. But some, as a result, write poems that point in man to the endangered earth and its inhabitants. They are eco-activist poets. Most poets are not eco-activists and yet can be deeply concerned with the place we, they live in. But some eco-activist poets write poems promoting e ecological literacy. Uh, at this moment, though, though we are not eco-activists, we poets also should pay attention to what we can do to improve and promote ecological literacy. The eco-poems can be used for practical educational purposes, that is, to heighten the awareness of Mother Nature. Here is what ecological literacy means. Ecological literacy, eco, eco uh, ecosystem uh, concept uh, in its broadest sense can be defined as an ability to read the many interwoven relationships, biotic and abiotic, that are comprised of Earth. But uh, what does that mean? Is it logical to assume that we can read the Earth? Not too many years ago, a large percentage of families in the U.S. made their living as traditional family map farmers. 
they planted uh, by the almanac of the moon and predict the weather by watching the sky and biological signs, such as thickness of tree bark and animal activities working with the land in a manner that was nurturing to the earth and sustaining for humans and other species. They did this not with the use of modern technology such as electronics and uh, synthetic chemicals, but by understanding nature's patterns, cycles, and nasty systems. Our long history of coexisting with our surroundings is written in the rocks, the plant, and animal ecology, and the, on the eco-social cultural fabric of relationship between humans and other species. Many of us worldwide have lost our ability to understand these relationships of the earth because today we live our lives differently. Understanding of patterns in nature is uh, the emphasized or ignored for a human economy based on the exchange, uh, exchange, exchange of money for material stuff and convenience of life. Along with the loss of how to observe ecological relationships as common sense, uh, there, uh, there are now uh, detrimental effects on the health of North Americans due to this lack of experience in, in the outdoors, asthma, diabetes, perceived nature attention deficiency, defic uh, deficient order, disorder. Although the U.S. education system concentrates on educating youth in a manner in which they can become financially successful, this idea does not equate with psychological happiness or subjective well-being. And too often, happiness is concomitant uh, with the production and exchange and distribution, consumption and disposal of material stuff, namely relations based on consumerism. Educators like Mitchell believe we should teach students in the importance of envir environment and discuss how to teach students to be ecologically literate the article is not about uh, poetry and does not talk about how to teach ecology poetry and literature. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, a bit longer. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, we are going to put this uh, article together later on, so we'll uh, finish. Okay, we'll take a uh, 10 minutes break here. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think uh, this message is drawing to a close, and uh, this is, in fact, the last meeting. Uh, we began with the H's uh, early point, right, the Lake Carlo Ministry, and we are going to end with the same poem. Uh, and additionally, we are going to re read uh, a few poems, nature poems, so-called, and I call them ecological poems. Um, uh, what is interesting is uh, you can find bird imagery, images of bird, uh, in almost all of the poems you are going to read. And also there is an uh, imagery, water imagery, the image of water. So we are going to focus on those things. And uh, this morning I'm going to finish reading the essay, right? Okay, Yeshin Ecology, uh, part three, page 174. Romantics in Yeish. Some of Yeish's poems are eco poems on which my essay, Will I Have, shed some light. Yeish's nature poetry is different from Wordsworth's or Shelley's nature poetry. I hesitate to call Wordsworth and Shelley eco poets because they sing nature directly and because when they lived, the world was not like our world. Likewise, I hesitate to call Yeats a nature poet for the same reason, yet Yeats is ecological poem. I prefer this term to eco poem because the letter sounds to me like an eco-activist poem by eco-activists. Though I respect and encourage them with all my heart are not songs of nature. The Yeats's ecological poems show a complicated process in relation to nature. Even the early poems he wrote in close contact with nature cannot be outright nature poems as, as Wordsworth, as was as Wordsworth. Shelley, Wordsworth, and Yeats, for instance, are different. Shelley, like Yeats, often uses nature symbolically, but 
what he does is quite natural. He depicts what is indescribable, what is abstract, like intellect, by way of natural phenomena, uh, which is supremely beautiful. First, Shelley is him to intellectual beauty. Let's see how Shelley makes use of the image of nature to express his intellectual beauty. The intellectual beauty is invisible to man, and the images the poem uses help the readers visualize what the intellectual beauty is. For example, uh, first stanza, him to intellectual beauty. The awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though unseen among us, visiting this various world with an inconstant wing as summer winds that creep from flower to flower. Okay, this awful shadow of some, un uh, un some unseen power, what is it? Power is capitalized, power. Intellect, intellect, right? So intellect is uh, compared to what? Something flying, right? Floats, though unseen among us, visiting this various world with in, uh, with as a constant wing as summer winds that creep from flower, flower to flower. So it's compared uh, with, with wind, right? Like, uh, like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shower, it visits with a constant glance, each human heart and countenance. So sometimes it's compared, it's like what? Moonbeam. Uh, it, it visits you from time to time, right? Like hues in harmonies of evening, like clouds in starlight, starlight widely spread, like memory of music fled, like oat that for his grace may be dear, and yet dearer for his mystery. Uh, I, this is stanza one in which Shelley borrows nature's elements such as summer wind, flower, moonbeams, a piney mountain shower, she was in harmonies of evening, clouds, clouds, in order to express what is invisible. Shelley was a keen observer of nature. He was both a natural scientist and poet, so his poetry is different from other romantic poets. This poem begins with half knowledge of the awful shadow of some un uh, unseen power. We have not seen it, it is unseen. Then the poet begins to give some hint. It floats, though unseen among us. It is unseen that it floats. The image of some shadow that floats, that of a bee or a butterfly, or that of summer winds, or that of the moonbeams behind some piney mountain. Like that, the intellectual beauty visits human hearts, like hues and harmonies of evening, like clouds, or like something dearer than anything. It visits human heart with inconstant glance. Like this, a poem is a process of natural phenomena taking place in the reader who shares the same experience in nature with the poet. If it's not an equal poem, what is? What, what is it? Next, Wordsworth, I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered uh, lonely as a cloud that floats on high or hills and uh, veils and hills, when all at once I, cloud, I saw a cloud, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the bridge. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant and pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure feels and dances with, with daffodils. The poet pictures to himself a cloud, which is the poet himself that floats high over the hills, and the cloud suddenly sees a host of golden daffodils beside the flake, beside the lake, fluttering and dancing in the bridge. Then in the last stanza, we learn that it is his imagination that he is one with nature. And then his heart fills with pleasure and dances with daffodils. This poem is simple and beautiful, appealing to the readers. It is a nature poem, but if some will write it again today, it can be called an eco poem. Where could the readers find such a host of daffodils near them? Maybe the only thing he could find is something else. Some vast fields with cultivated plants. Many other plants and flowers have been destroyed a long time ago. Bees and butterflies, all insects, birds, snakes, and frogs will be gone eventually. The sky vacant with no dancing formation of birds. Flying in it, 
with smoke taking the place of white clouds, is it really the nature in which we could live in 100 years? If all bees and butterflies are gone, we could not live because there will not be any more grain of wheat and barley. Uh, Yeechi poems using Ireland as nature, animals, plants, the minerals, the elements, and the universe in relation to Irish country people is mental and physical activities are ecological poems. An ecological poem is different from an ecologue or a pastoral dialogue or pastoral. A poem written in relation to nature and or human nature is an ecological poem. We have always thought that we are part of nature uh, and that we cannot live without nature. As the ecological poet, Yeats did not write poems of didactic nature, though some are concerned with some social issues. Rather, the poems that concern politics, ide ideology, art, philosophy, civilization, and so on, demonstrate his belief in thought. They do not purport to teach the readers. Sometimes they seek to persuade the readers, as David Orr claims, but they are not didactic at all. Even pure poetry exists to appeal to the readers. Now, Yes, the delay call all of Innisfree. I will rise and go now and go to Innisfree. And a small cabin, cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bin rows will I have there. I for the honey bee. I live alone in the bee loud clay. <coughs> and I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight all a glimmer, noon a purple glow and evening full of linnet's wings. I will rise and go now, for always night and day I, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the heart, deep heart's core. This poem is, was written in London while Yeats was in London in 1890. It is not a simple poem, but only Yeats's escapist nostalgia, as some critics and readers think. It is a poem which expresses the idea of a paradise north. Yeats had once uh, read Thor's Walden and wanted to live on Innisfree as Thor did. It is important to know that both Thor and Yeats wanted to live in harmony with nature, but as James uh, Loyenbach asked, is it a useful poem for us? Would Yeats have written the same poem if he had experienced World War I and the Irish Civil War Maybe yes and no, yes. It was inspired by old Irish poems. Recently, Maura Grace Harrington had discovered the source, sources of this poem in three medieval poems of Ireland. No, yes, she might have been concerned more with the reality around him, as we see in the long poem, Meditation in Time of Civil War. The Lake Hall of Innisfree consists of three stanzas. In stanza one, the poor speaker has a wish to go, build a cabin, raise a honey bee hive, cultivate nine bin rows in the paradise. Stanza two is what the paradise is. An island is free in Sligo where he had spent his childhood. In stanza three, the speaker is still dreaming but soon realizes that he is on the gray pavement only hearing the lake water lapping in his deep heart scroll. This poem also poses a question of what we have to do between nature and the city life. If we cannot make a choice, we need to be in harmony with it. Section four, Yeats and Ecology Poetry. What poetry do we need now? We have already experienced two extreme cases of poetry, didactic and pure poetry. Ecological po poetry could be neither didactic nor pure, nor didactic or pure, or nothing like that. We need a poetry that is both beauty and truth, and it can be in any form and content, uh, but has to be true and beautiful. You can find many kinds in Yeish. Let me classify Yeish poetry into subcategories, though not exhaustive without discussing them in detail. Hopefully, I'll be able to further read them in future. Ecological poems of nature with the imagery of animals, plants, elements, universe. Ecological, bird, unicorn, air, autumn, swan, dolphin, dawn, twilight, glimmer, fly, cat, long-necked bird, be loud, clay, rose, etc. Other poets, including namely romantic poets, Frost, William, uh, William, Kim Chun Su. Ecological, two, ecological poems of man about place, space, rhythm, cycle. A vision poems, other poets, including Don, Blake, Pound. Ecological poems with music, songs and bellows, 
Other poets include Charlie Blake, Walter Stevens, Gertrude Stein, Kim Chun Su, Picasso. Four, radical ecological poems such as Circus Animals Desertion. Other po poets, including Pound and Elliot, the latter with Wasteland. Five, philosophical poems, cyclical and e ecological, with the imagery of dawn, twilight, bird song, civilization, etc. In closing, I would quote G.H. and James Bridge, first priest of uh, Britain and the head gardener of Claude Monet's Gevrani Garden, 44 miles north, uh, northwest of Paris, France. Gardening seems to be an apt uh, analogy to the writing of ecological poetry. What follows is uh, Lothar's interview with priest, who is the head gardener of Monet's garden, Gevrani. Monet was gardening uh, with an artist, artist's eye, he said. He would make a uh, backwash of blue and put a little bit of yellow purple. He drops in his color. The feel of painting is what priest hopes the garden will evolve for visitors. Monet spent his life trying to go further in everything, and especially further in the way. He looked at light and its perfections, and the way he tried to translate that into feeling, says priest, not noting that his favorite Monet paintings are of the water lilies. It is a unique garden that you can't copy in my eyes, but during Monet's lifetime, when the garden was private, he could easily let areas go un un unattended on a whim, and when he didn't need them for painting. Poets who write eco poems should be like Monet the gardener. Without their ideal garden in their mind, how could they depict it on canvas? Sometimes they can let gardens go unattended, untended, un untended. If the garden, it, if the garden is about how to write an ecological poem, the next is about what to do with Mother Nature. It is explicitly about a war condition, but we can stretch the meaning of the poem. The bees build in the crevices of loosening masonry. There, the mother birds bring grubs and flies. My world is loosening. Honey bees. Honeybees, come build in the empty house of the stair. We are closed in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. Somewhere, a man is killed, a house burnt. Yet, no clear fact to be discerned. Come, build the empty house of the stair. <clears throat> this is stanza one, section four, the stairs nest by my window, meditations in time of civil war. Two great themes are in tandem, but it is meaningful that the bees come first, nature comes first. In the 10 line stanza, lines five and 10 ask the bees to come, build in the stairs nest. We are closed in, the key is turn, turned on our uncertainty. This is where we are on our only planet. As in the civil war, we are closed in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. This is not, a, not only a poem about the Irish civil war, it is both about our present condition and about where we should go from here on the only and sole earth. Okay, uh, why don't we go to the uh, ecological point by uh, Yeats. Okay, take one. Uh, uh, probably we can have a look at the uh, Thorba lily. This is the tower, right? Thorba lily castle is a fortified 15th century uh, high bono Norman tower house built by the Sattu Birgo or Burke near the town of Gorton County, Galway Island. It's also known as Yeats' Tower because it was once owned and inhabited by the poet William Butler Yeats. Uh, the castle was built in 15th uh, century and originally formed part of the huge estate of the Earls of Clanley Card uh, from the Burgo or Burke family near the Four Arch Bridge, based around 1825. In 1837, the Carrie. Okay, uh, the nearby four art bridges dates around, okay. The Carrick family was recorded as living in the castle. Uh, 
uh, in the early 1900s, Castle Tower was still owned by the Gregory family. It became part of nearby Cool Estate, home of Lady Gregory, Lady Augusta Gregory, Yates' lifelong friend. So, two poems we are going to read are about uh, uh, Cool, the Cool Estate. Uh, on the estate, the Cool House, where Lady Gray lived, was the center for meetings for the Irish Literary Group, a group composed of a great number of preeminent figures of day near the tower in Cool Park, began the literally Irish, Irish Literary Revival. Uh, okay, the Uh, okay, the architecture. Uh, with four floors, the tower consists of one room on each floor that is connected with a spiral stone stair stairway built into the seven, th seven foot thickness of the massive outer wall. Each floor has a window that overlooks the Streamtown, Streamtown, Streamstown River that flows along the tower. Uh, there is a small a thatched cottage attached. Uh, I'll show you. Yates described the ground floor chamber as the pleasantest room I have, I have yet seen. A great, great wide window opening over the river and the round arched floor leading to the thatched hall. He also admired the mural there, symbolically declaring this winding, uh, uh, gyring, sparring treadmill of a stair is my ancestral stair that uh, Goldsmiths and Dean Berkeley and Ber uh, Berg have traveled there. Uh, there's a tablet on the wall that commemorates uh, sojourn. I, the uh, poet William Yates with old male uh, boards and uh, sea green slate, smithy work from the gold falls, restored this tower for my wife, George. And may these characters remain when all is ruined once again. Okay, uh, I'll show you the cottage. Uh, there, is, there is a cottage here, right? Uh, uh, water flows here, around here. This uh, breeze here, okay. Okay, uh, the first poem, I'll skip the first poem, right? Uh, the poem was written in uh, 1850. Uh, Yeats was 25 years old at the time. The Lake Carlo Winstrey, right? Uh, like you, right? Uh, it was written at, a, at the age of 25, right? Uh, the next poem is uh, The White Bird. And he wrote it, he wrote it at the age of 27. And actually, uh, Yeats had just proposed to Modgon. Uh, this is the first proposal to her, and she rejected it. They, they walked together, and looking at the uh, seagulls, uh, Modgon said, uh, if I were a bird, I would be seagulls. She said that. And uh, he was inspired by what he said, okay? The white birds. I would uh, that we were white birds on the form of sea. So I wish we were uh, white birds on the form of sea. We tire the flame of meteor before it can fade and flee. The flame of the blue star of twilight hung low on the rim of the sky has waked in, my, in our hearts, my beloved, sadness that may not die. Awake in our hearts, sadness that may not die. The weariness comes from uh, those dreamers do devil, the lily, rose, ah, uh, dream not of them, beloved. The flame of the meteor that goes, or the flame of the blue star that lingers hung low in the fall of dew, for I would uh, we were changed to white birds on the wandering form, I and you. I'm haunted by numbers islands and many Danan, Danan of shore. Uh, Danan is a uh, kind of, um, Irish paradise, where time would surely forget us and sorrow come near, uh, near us no more. 
soon fr far from the rose and the lily and the practice of the flames would we be were we only white birds buoyed out on the on the form of the sea so uh, this poem reflects what his mood right uh, he is not uh, happy right because he, he was rejected and the, the next poem is the wild swans are cool probably uh, it was written uh, at the age of 32 uh, 32 uh, just after uh, Oh, no, no, uh, one swan called, it was written in, uh, at age 51, 51, uh, uh, it was written in 1916. Uh, actually, just after he had pro proposed to Modgon for the last time, he was rejected. Uh, and, uh, right, and, and uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he married. He he he, he married uh, a woman, uh, Josiah Lee, uh, at the age of 52, and she was 25, and uh, they were very happy, right? Uh, and uh, okay, the ones who want to call. Some say this is the best poem by age. Very beautiful poem. The trees are in their autumn beauty, the woodland paths are dry, under the October twilight, the water mirrors the still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished all suddenly mount and scatter willing and great broken wings uh, upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon those brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All changed since I, hearing at twilight, the first time on the shore, the bell beat of the wings above my head, trod with the lighter tread. Unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold, companionable streams or climb the air. Their hearts have not grown old. Passion of conquest, wonder where they will up attend upon them still. But now they drift on the still water, Mysterious and beautiful, among what rushes will they build? By what lakes as or pool? They like man's eyes when I wake someday to find they have flown away. And uh, the next poem, Sailing to Byzantium, uh, it was written at age 51. 61. Uh, there is a bird here, bird image. This, this bird is not a natural bird, it's a golden bird. Yeats wants to be a golden bird, right? There is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon fall, the mackerel crowd their seas, fish, flash, or fowl, command all summer along. Whatever is begotten, born and died, caught in that sensual music, all neglected monuments of an aging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless so clap its hands and sing, and louder sing. For every tatter in his mortal dress, nor is there singing school but studying monuments of his own magnificence. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O oh, sage is standing in the God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in the gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away. Sick with desire and fashion to a dying animal, it knows not what it is. Gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out, out of nature, I shall never take my bodily, bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to ladies those and ladies of Byzantium, what is past, the passing, or to come. And finally, uh, Cool Park in Balili, 1931. Uh, he was, Yeats was 66 when he wrote this poem. 
about seven years before he died at the age of uh, 73, Cool Park. Under my window ledge, the waters raised. You see the, the, the Cool Park? There is, a, uh, uh, there is a river flowing beside it. So under my window ledge, the water, waters raised. Others below and more hands on top. Meaning what? Others in the water and uh, more hands on the surface of the river, right? Others below and more hands on the top. Run, raised, run. Verbs are repeated, right? The waters raised and uh, run. For a mile, undimmed in heaven's face. Undimmed in heaven's face. So it flows uh, above the uh, uh, surface of the earth, right? Uh, uh, then, darkening it through dark rough uh, trees, Scylla drop. Uh, left tree is a uh, old poet. Hmm? Right. Uh, darkening through then, darkening through dark, left tree, Scylla drop, run underground, water drops into the hole and run underground, and rise in a rocky place in cool demean or demain, cool demain. And there to finish up, spread to a lake and drop into a hole, drop in a hole. What's water but the generated soul? This is a comparison. What is it? If not, it is a soul, right? What's water but the generated soul? Upon the border of, the, of uh, that lake's a wood, now all dry sticks under wintry sun. In a copse of beaches, there I stood, for nature's pulled her tragic buskin on. Buskin is a kind of footwear worn by actors, right? Actors, buskin. Uh, actors of tragedy, right? Buskin. Nature's pulled her tragic buskin on, and all the rents mirror of my mood at sudden thunder of the mounting swan. There is a, there is a mounting swan flying up, right? I turned about and looked where branches break, yeah, the glittering riches of the flo flooded lake. Another emblem there. What is it? Another emblem there. Swan, maybe, swan. That uh, stormy white, uh, but seems a concentration sky, right? The stormy white. Maybe a swan, uh, only seems, a, seems like a concentration of sky, right? White, white, white swan. And like the soul, and is, it sails into the sight. It sails into the sight, right? The, the bird. And in the morning, gone, no man knows why. And it's so lovely that it's set to write to what knowledge is or its lack had said awry. So arrogantly pure, child might think it could be murdered with a spot of ink, right? Uh, the, the, uh, there's a white bird and a swan. You can blot it out with an ink, right? right. Sound of a stick upon the floor, a sound from somebody that tolls from chair to chair. Beloved books, famous hands have bound, old marble hands, old pictures everywhere. This is a description of the uh, house, big house, Lady Gregory's house, or, right? Uh, great rooms where traveled men and children found content or joy, a last inheritor, uh, Gregory's uh, son. He was killed, he was, he was a great man. He was a painter and a soldier, right? The, uh, a, a great inheritor, he was killed in action. Right? He was a pilot. Uh, a last inheritor where none has reigned that lacked the name and fame, or out of folly into folly came. A spot where the founders lived and died seemed once more more dear than life. And so ancestral tree is a garden rich in memory glorified marriages, alliances, families, and every bride's amb ambition satisfied. Where fashion or mere fantasy decrees, we shift about. 
all the great glory is spent, like some poor Arab tribesman in his tent. We were the last romantics, chose for theme, traditional sanctity and loveliness. What was written in what poet's name, the book of the people, whatever most can bless, the mind of man or elevate the rhyme, but all is changed. That high, uh, that high horse rideless, that high horse rideless. Though mounted in the saddle, Homer rode. Though Homer uh, 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 mounted on the saddle, uh, rode right. So uh, the horse. What kind of horse, horse is it? Pegasus. Right, inspiration. Right, uh, where the swan drifts upon a darkening flood. So th uh, this this poem is complex, right? Compared with the first poem, in spray, it's a very complex poem. Okay, we'll take uh, ten minutes break. Yes. <laughs>